In 1981, I was at the National Institutes of Health. I was a senior investigator and the head of a laboratory called the Laboratory of Immunoregulation, of which I still maintain that laboratory uh, 30 years later. Uh, what we were studying at the time before the appearance of the AIDS cases that we first saw then was the interface between infectious diseases and the immune system, and particularly the regulation and dysregulation of the human immune system. I remember it very, very clearly because it was associated with some major decisions I made about changing the direction of my career. I was sitting in my office at the NIH Clinical Center, the research hospital where I had my laboratories, and um, what came on my desk in June of 1981 was the June 5th uh, edition of Morbidity Mortality Weekly Report, the weekly uh, a summary that comes from the CDC. And it was a report of five otherwise healthy, interestingly and curiously, gay men who presented in Los Angeles with an unusual pneumonia called pneumocystis pneumonia, which is seen only in individuals who have a compromised body defenses or immune system. I had seen several patients with pneumocystis because as an infectious diseases clinician, I was not infrequently called to consult on patients from the Cancer Institute who were receiving chemotherapy and would occasionally get this bizarre type of pneumonia. I didn't make anything of the initial report because it just was curious, a little disturbing, wasn't quite sure what was going on. And then exactly one month later, on the 4th of July of 1981, another edition of MMWR landed on my desk as it does every week, and I read it. Uh, and now this was an additional 26 men, again, curiously, all gay men, all previously healthy, who presented now not only with pneumocystis pneumonia, but also with a strange cancer called Kaposi sarcoma and other infections. And it was at that point that I fully realized and knew, and I actually remember getting goose pimples about it because saying, oh my goodness, this is a new disease and it must be a new infection or a mutated form of another infection because it was well known at the time that gay men often got a variety of different infections. Uh, bowel infections, hepatitis, uh, things like that. I didn't know what it was, but I made a decision then in the middle of the summer of 1981 that I was actually going to change the direction of my career and start bringing into the hospital and studying these unusual situations of gay men who had this strange disease. In fact, we used to call it then for a while gay-related immunodeficiency or GRID until it became clear that the disease went well beyond the gay community and involved essentially anyone who would practice risk behavior that would put them at risk. I actually wrote an article in December of 1981 that ultimately got published in June of 1982 in the Annals of Internal Medicine. It was a commentary. And in the commentary, I stated very clearly, although we don't know what this agent, if it is an agent, is, that because it is seen almost exclusively in an epidemiologically restricted population, anyone who assumes that this disease is going to stay confined to the gay population is making that assumption based on no scientific data. So be careful because it very likely is going to spread well beyond this. And I said it, you know, in, in a commentary. I didn't have any data. I didn't have the virus. It just looked to me saying, here's an infection. It's being almost certainly sexually transmitted. There are a few things in the world that are universal. One is sexuality. The other is you got to eat and you got to drink. And if you're going to procreate, you're going to have sex. And even if you don't want to procreate, you're going to have sex. I was following the cases that were being reported and was preparing my lab uh, and my uh, 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 team that I was putting together. And then when we finally got a small team together, uh, myself and literally just a couple of other people, not very many people were interested in studying this, we began in earnest admitting patients right in the very beginning of the year, right around the, the Christmas, New Year's holiday, 1981-82. 
So I got very concerned that a sexually transmitted infection that was lethal, because by that time it became very clear to me, because all of my patients were dying, that this was something that we really better be careful of. And it was that kind of concern that made me very confident that I was making the right decision in turning the direction of my research away from inflammatory diseases to study this bizarre new syndrome that was appearing among gay men. Well, it was very interesting because unlike other research projects, the patients who came in to see us were very advanced in their disease. And I spent as much or more time as a physician taking care of the patients as we did doing classical bench research. So it's an interesting phenomenon. Uh, notwithstanding the intensive amount of time we had to put in to take care of them, but at the time, my laboratory was a lab that had been studying aberrant B cell function, B lymphocyte function, in people with different types of hypersensitivity or autoimmune diseases. So we were expert, as it were, on looking at abnormalities in B cells and in T cells. So even though we suspected it was a virus, in fact, we were sure it was a virus, we didn't know what virus it was, we looked phenomenologically at what was wrong with their immune system. So we began studying their T cells and their B cells. And from my lab, we made some of the earliest seminal observations that this disease was characterized paradoxically by an aberrant immune activation, even though it was an immunodeficiency disease. And the first paper that we published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1983 uh, made that observation that isn't it curious that there be cells uh, that really are not, we didn't know what cells were infected or not because we didn't even know what infection it was, but their B cells were hyperactive and yet they did not function very well. And that was our statement back then that isn't it curious that this has a disease of hyperactivity of the immune system at the same time as it's a immunodeficiency. And then the following year, we pinpointed the very nature of the uh, T cell uh, defect, one of antigen-specific uh, T cell defect. We did that for a couple of years, and then when the breakthrough from other labs, from Montagnier in Paris and from Gallo in the United States, once we got the virus in our hands, namely in 1984, and 1985, then we began to study in earnest uh, some of the pathogenic events. And, and from then until this very day, we study the pathogenesis of HIV disease, both in treated and untreated individuals. The first cases were in the summer of 1981. The paper from Montagnier uh, that showed the famous electron micrograph of the virus in people with this lymph node uh, enlargement. Uh, that was in May of 1983. And then a year later, in May of 1984, Gallo showed the absolute connection between the virus and the disease. So it was two to three years following the initial observation. When uh, Bob Gallo proved that it was the etiologic agent in 1984, we had a, a diagnostic test approved by the FDA in 1985. So the, the test was developed. It was gone through the appropriate validation and approved by the That was really quick from literally less than a year from the time that it was shown to be the virus that causes this disease. We started off with an antibody test. That's a very sensitive test. It's confirmed by what we call a Western blot test for, for diagnosis. It's very easy to do. Several generations later, we have tests that can be done literally in minutes. Uh, it could be done on saliva. It could be done on blood. But the molecular techniques to probe for the virus, PCR and a variety of other techniques that we now have are widely used throughout the world. And they're very sensitive and very good tests for the virus. There are a couple of aspects about HIV that are very unique and 
extremely frustrating with regard to the fact that you can't, not only can the body not spontaneously eradicate, you can't even eradicate it with drugs, even though you can effectively treat a person to the point of allowing them to lead a relatively normal life by suppressing the replication of the virus. But what the virus has is multiple characteristics, probably the two most important of which are that a, it mutates very rapidly. It's an RNA virus. It replicates at an enormous rate, and it mutates. So the body's immune system is constantly trying to catch up with it and essentially never does. It partially suppresses, but certainly never completely, with very few exceptions in a group of patients called elite controllers. But that's less than 1% of the people that are infected. The other thing is that it's a retrovirus, so it integrates itself into the genes of a cell, and it hides there in what we call a reservoir. So there are infected cells that are not being seen by the immune system. The other thing is that the part of the virus that would induce a response that would be able to suppress and protect you, namely a neutralizing antibody, is hidden from open view of the immune system. There is the confirmation of the virus protects that critical part, like the part that binds to the molecule on the CD4 cell, that's shielded from the body's immune system. And only recently, over the last year or two, by using structural biological techniques, have we been able to get a handle on that very, very important component of the envelope or the outer coating of the virus to be able to start making intelligent, structure-based vaccine designs. Did anything surprise me? Well, yes, uh, everything surprised me about it because it was the first time a retrovirus that replicated, I mean, uh, uh, HTLV-1, was discovered by uh, Gallo as a cause of uh, T-cell leukemias in the 70s. So, but it wasn't a virus that was destroying cells. It was inducing a, a tumor. What surprised me about HIV was its recalcitrance to being able to be suppressed. And most surprising was the curious observation that is true today of how the immune system just cannot handle this virus. If you look at any, even the deadliest historic scourges, the bubonic plague, which is a bacteria, but smallpox as a virus, polio as a virus, measles as a virus, all of those, even though they had a considerable degree of morbidity and some mortality, at the end of the day, the body proved the concept that it could ultimately suppress the virus, eradicate the virus, and leave you with lifelong protection against reinfection. That didn't happen with HIV. So if you ask me of what the one thing that surprised me, shocked me, and scared me a bit, was that here was a virus that the immune system just was not particularly challenging to this virus. It suppressed it a little, but the virus always won the battle against the immune system. Research into treatment began immediately, immediately after the virus was isolated. So as soon as the virus was isolated, we began here at NIH screening drugs that were already on the shelf for other reasons as well as the beginning of what's called targeted antiviral, where you delineate all the functions of all the genes of the virus and see if you can specifically block those functions by, by molecules that you would develop to specifically block it. But that took a while. In the beginning, the only thing we had was this virus replicating you know, in a culture. So the first approach was screening molecules, and that's what the contribution of people like Sam Broda and Burroughs Welcome were, because what they did is they screened a whole bunch of molecules, and one of them, AZT, which later became zidovudine, uh, AZT is a reverse transcriptase inhibitor that was originally developed for the treatment of cancer and wasn't a particularly good anti-cancer drug. When that drug was screened, it blocked completely 
HIV. And then it went into the preclinical, into a clinical trial, and that's how we had the first clinical trial of an AIDS drug, and that's how AZT got approved in 1987 by the FDA. It was tough in the beginning. Uh, I had considerable resistance um, from people trying to discourage me from directing my own career towards this. I had some mentors who would say, why are you wasting your time on this disease that's involving a very well-defined group of disenfranchised people? Uh, as the time went by, when I began to push for more resources with the Congress, with the administration, with the secretaries, with, with all of the people I dealt with, to try and convince them to do more. It was a mixed response. Some people heard what I said and said, I understand this is going to be something bad. We've really got to go after it. And other people did not. And it really depended upon who you were talking with and what their other interests were. I know in the infectious diseases community, uh, uh, there were individuals who thought that we were overdoing it. I developed a, a special division of AIDS here at the National Institutes of Health, and there were some of the classical infectious diseases people who, quite frankly, felt very offended at that and were uh, uh, made their thoughts and their feelings known about that, that thinking I was overemphasizing a disease that was only affecting a few thousand people. They're no longer here. Uh, <laughs> But uh, it, unfortunately, my instincts were proven to be correct, and that's unfortunate because we know we now have had 30 million deaths on HIV and 33 million people living with HIV infection. In 1984, when the position of the director of NIAID, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, opened, I never really had any interest in, in administration. I was fundamentally a, a bench scientist who was also a clinician who was uh, trained and practiced both infectious diseases and clinical immunology. But it became clear to me that particularly with AIDS, but also with other emerging infections and the, the gradual evolution of our interest in, in global health and the impact of infectious diseases on global health, I thought I could have a greater impact on the field if I took on the added responsibility of running the institute. It wasn't a stopping my research and stopping seeing patients. It, I took it under the condition that I would also be able to continue to do my research and to continue to see patients. The secretary uh, agreed to that, the director of NIH agreed to that, and that's what I'm doing right now. I'm not only continuing as a scientist and as a clinician, but I also now have the responsibility for the broader uh, research with the, uh, an institute that's primarily responsible for most of the infectious diseases research, including HIV AIDS in the world. I was very uh, transparent and upfront about our needs. We didn't always get what we wanted, but I tried to articulate as best as we could. Uh, to the Congress and to virtually every president since Ronald Reagan. I've had the privilege of being able to, to interact with, speak with on more than one occasion, depending on the president, uh, starting off with uh, President Reagan, very intensively with George H.W. Bush, and very intensively with President Clinton, and then really quite intensively with George W. Bush, particularly in the development of the PEPFAR program, which he asked me to help put together for, you know, for, the, uh, for the country and for, the, uh, for his presidency, which ultimately became the president's emergency plan for AIDS relief. And also with the current president, who is, has an obvious, as we all know, very, very uh, intense interest in global health. With the Congress, um, we've been very fortunate to have bipartisan support for the AIDS effort. Uh, in every Congress that I have interacted with since the summer of 1981 up until this current day right now, uh, in the early years, it was interesting because sometimes you would see when you would have a split government with a Republican president and a Democratic Congress or a Democratic Congress and a uh, uh, Republican president, vice versa, um, that you would often see some uh, tension back and forth. But for the most part, 
even though sometimes the hearings got a little tense, at the end of the day, the support for HIV research was always there, both on the part of the Congress and on the part of the administration. Very early on in the course of this pandemic, the activists uh, were making extremely good points about the uniqueness of this, the need to do more, the need to be less rigid in our regulatory approaches towards the approval and testing of new drugs, and the rigidity and lack of flexibility in how we design clinical trials, all of which were the classical way to approach drug development, therapeutic developments, clinical trials, and FDA approval. Um, they wanted to get our attention, so they would do it in a very theatrical way, and they scared a lot, because for the most part, the scientific community and the regulatory community are conservative. And I say conservative, I don't mean conservative in an ideological, political way, but conservative in their approach towards science. It's nice to, that people are interested who are not scientists, but leave them out of it and let us scientists make the decision. So they didn't pay much attention to the uh, activists. I, for one reason or other, began reading intensively what they were writing. And even though when they were demonstrating and closing down Wall Street and invading St. Patrick's Cathedral and doing things like that, looking very eccentric and scary to some people, I try to phase that out and just listen to what they said and re read what they wrote, and they were making perfect sense. So since I was always out there as a government official, they equated me, my face, my name, with the federal government. So they began to demonstrate against the NIH. And right here on our campus, they you know, came in, invaded the campus, smoke bombs, you know, wanting to get arrested. And I made probably the best decision in my interaction with community is that I agreed with what they were saying. So I went downstairs outside when they were all over the lawns and all over the property and they were just about getting to, ready to be mass arrested. And I told the Montgomery County Police, don't arrest them, just get five of the uh, uh, leaders or more and bring them up to my conference room. Uh, in fact, where we're sitting right here. Uh, and. Uh, have them come up and talk to me. They were shocked, the activists. No one had ever spoken to them. The only thing they did was to try and get them arrested. We spent a couple of hours talking about how we could work together and how, even though much of said of what they said was correct, a lot of what they said was not correct. So they learned from me and I learned from them. And ever since then, we've had an extraordinary relationship with the activist community. They're, they're on our advisory boards, on our clinical committees, on our community committees, and it, it's become an extraordinary partnership. There is no doubt that the uh, persistence, energy, and articulate way that many of the well-informed activist community was able to make their point had a significant influence on the funding of HIV AIDS. There's no doubt about that. To my knowledge, there has never been this type of activism. The AIDS activism was unique, it was effective, and it has now spawned activists. They've almost written the book on activism now. So other diseases, uh, though they are different diseases with different circumstances, without a doubt, look towards the AIDS activists and say, how do we get done what they got done? In fact, I've explicitly had people who are advocates for diseases that I have nothing to do with, no responsibility, no special expertise in, who've come to me asking the same question that you're asking, namely, tell us about the activists and their impact and influence on you and on the process because they want to they want to mimic that for their own diseases. Whenever you have a person who's well-known and well-respected, like a well-liked actor like Rock Hudson, uh, a very, very popular sports figure, 
like Magic Johnson, that the world, those in the world, those in this country who had a bit of a stigmatization approach towards HIV infection, particularly those who were not used to interacting with the gay community or with others, when they saw someone who they admired for other reasons and found out that they were HIV infected, even if they were a gay man like Rock Hudson, uh, they would say, well, you know, this disease, you know, really attacks anybody and maybe I should just drop back a few yards and get rid of the stigma. So what I think that the infections and the coming out of people who are well known, uh, particularly in the entertainment and sports industry, went a long way not only to get people's attention, but to also begin to remove some of the stigma associated with HIV. Dr. Coop was a close friend. I was his personal physician. Still, am. well, I'm I'm not still am. I am. He calls me up every once in a while, but he's geographically no longer here. He's in New Hampshire. But when he was um, uh, being chosen for the Surgeon General in the Reagan administration, he came down to Washington, and there was a lot of opposition because people thought he might be too conservative. So he spent months and months and months being led on a string of multiple hearings with no confirmation as Surgeon General. And he was getting very, very anxious about it. He was getting stressed and his blood pressure was up. So I was the person on campus here who uh, was generally the internist for the doctors who got sick because I was practicing medicine as opposed to just doing research with no medical connection. The Surgeon General, some people don't appreciate it, lives on the campus of NIH in a house literally a hundred feet from my office where I am in the administrative building now. So he was told to come and see me. I took care of him and I joke around with him a lot about it and I've said it publicly many times. After a classic big workup that I gave him, my diagnosis was the welcome to Washington stress syndrome, and that's what he had. And once he got approved and confirmed, uh, our friendship grew. He didn't do AIDS in the beginning, but then he decided this is a big problem. And when he would come home at, in the evening, he would walk by the building that I'm in to get to his house, and very frequently he would come up and sit down on the couch, sit down, relax, you know have a glass of water or a Coke or something and talk about HIV AIDS. And then he decided he was going to go ahead and do something about it. And then thus came the, the uh, Surgeon General's report and the letter to all the household. He taught himself about AIDS and had hours and hours and hours of conversation with me about it because that's what I was doing almost full time. So we are still friends to this day. I've, uh, we have a, a very good friendship. It was a very interesting process. AZT became available in 1987. We were all very optimistic about it, but our optimism was short-lived. And then we had the cold, sobering realization that we were in it for the long run because individuals who improved, I mean, the first study comparing AZT to a placebo, in the AZT group, there was one death. In the placebo group, there was 19 deaths. It was 19 to 1. So, I mean, it was very, very clear uh, that it was effective. But when you started using it, literally months, usually, sometimes longer, the virus did what you'd expect the virus to do. It mutated and then AZT as a single mono drug was no longer effective. The next drug didn't come out and be approved by the FDA for another couple of years after that. And then you had drugs that were used individually and then two at a time. And we did that for a few years until we got to the early to mid-1990s when the protease inhibitors were discovered, again by targeted drug development, crystallizing the protease enzyme and figuring out what molecule you could develop that would block that. And the first uh, prote protease inhibitors came out. A clinical trial was done with three drugs, including a protease inhibitor, and the results were stunning. The virus level 
plummeted to below detectable level. And then of the years from 1996 to the present, even better and better drugs were used. Non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase, better generation protease inhibitors, nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, integrase inhibitors, inhibitors of binding and fusion of the virus. So now we have more than 30 drugs that are approved by the FDA that when used in combinations have a striking, dramatic effect on suppressing the virus. So from 1996 until the present, we just did better and better and better with regard to drugs. We started working on a vaccine literally right after the virus was discovered. Uh, we got a component of the envelope and we used the envelope expecting somewhat naively, like with any other virus, get the outer coating, inject it into somebody, they'll make an immune response that was protective. And it was those first years of realizing that by injecting the outer covering or the envelope, the GP160, the GP140, the GP120, any of that into an individual induced an immune response, but the immune response was not protective. We started that like right after, like 84, 85, 86 was the first time that we did it. You know, the first uh, vaccine trial officially was started here at NIH in 1987, which was just three years after the virus was discovered. I could tell you exactly what the origin of the Vaccine Research Center was. Um, Dr. Harold Varmus, who was the NIH director at the time, and I uh, visited uh, President Clinton in the Oval Office because he and President Gore wanted a, uh, a little uh, uh, background and briefing on HIV, so I had the opportunity to brief him on various aspects of the science and the clinical issues uh, with HIV. Uh, and as we were walking out of the Oval Office, the president asked us, what is it that you really need right now? I said, well, we certainly desperately need a vaccine. And how could you get a vaccine more quickly? If, what could we do? And we said, you know, what we really do need is a center that's devoted entirely from basic science up through the clinical trials to develop a vaccine. And uh, when the president decides he wants to do something, it gets done. And he just said, fine, let's do a vaccine center at the NIH. And that was it. And very, very quickly it went up. And now it's really one of the prize scientific uh, centers here at NIH. We have, for the first time a year and a half ago, a vaccine. We, we started the first trial in, in 1987, and we had 23 years worth of disappointment. Uh, until last year, a year and a half ago, when the Thai trial, which is referred to as RV144, in 16,000 uh, individuals in Thailand, showed the first signal of efficacy. It was only 31%, not enough for prime time, but enough to prove the concept that you can actually get a vaccine that would prevent acquisition of infection. Since then, we've been very, very... Um, uh, energetically pursuing vaccine development with a number of important new discoveries, namely the monoclonal antibodies that people rarely make that are antibodies that identify a component of the virus that actually would induce a broadly reacting neutralizing response. And now by using structure-based vaccine design, we're doing the same sort of design of vaccine using structure as our tool as we did years ago with drugs when we used the various components of the virus as targets for drugs, we're doing the same thing in a structure-based vaccine design. In my own lab, we're still involved in the pathogenesis of HIV infection. Uh, we're studying the reservoirs of HIV, which is aimed at trying to develop a cure for HIV to be able to delineate better that small recalcitrant reservoir? Is there any way that we could get rid of that reservoir, either immunologically or pharmacologically? That's one component of the research. The other is we've been fortunate enough to find and uh, discover a new receptor for HIV that plays a major role in the transmission across mucosal barriers, and that is steering us in the direction of vaccine development. I think that the whole study of HIV was a big boost 
not only in the study of any kinds of viruses, the molecular approaches, the ability to do high throughput sequencing and get uh, various uh, 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 versions of what we call the quasi-species or the, the different components that it, it isn't one virus that's uniform. It's what we call a quasi-species, which means there are multiple subtle changes. It exists almost like in a swarm of viruses as opposed to one identical virus that you have millions of copies of. There are millions of copies of different types of, uh, of modifications of the virus. So, but a lot of other disciplines benefited from the study of HIV, even our understanding of the immune system and the fact that the regulation of the immune system is a very complex, interdigitated process that was by an experiment of nature. In this case, the experiment was the infection of the human species with this virus has, been a, has allowed us to be able to delineate much more precisely many of those circuits of regulation of the immune system. Vaccine is going to be part of a combination prevention approach. We already have within our grasp the tools, if fully implemented, to really turn around the AIDS pandemic. We have very effective prevention modalities, from behavior modification to condoms, needle exchange, mother-to-child transmission, circumcision, topical microbicides, pre-exposure prophylaxis, and the most recent dramatic game-changing uh, observation that was made very recently from an NIH study that was a multinational study, but sponsored by my institute, was what's called HPTN052, which was the trial that showed that the earlier you treat an infected person compared to waiting a little bit till their disease progress, not only do we have what we already know is a beneficial effect on the infected person, but a dramatic, truly dramatic decrease in the likelihood that that person will transmit the virus to their sexual partner. And that is a game-changing study which proves that treatment itself can serve as a form of prevention. If you compare the people who receive therapy early, namely right at the beginning of the study, the chances of their transmitting virus to their sexual partner compared to the people who delayed therapy till they got to a certain point, there were 28 linked infections, 27 of them occurred in the people who delayed their treatment in their sexual partners, 27 of the infections of sexual partners versus one infection in the people. That is a highly significant effect of a 96% decrease in infection. We have a, a component of our large AIDS clinical trials network is the prevention trials network. So if you consider vaccine as prevention, we have a substantial, uh, at the NIH, half a billion dollar per year vaccine effort, uh, more than that actually, close to $600 million. But in prevention, we, we have a number of things. We have behavioral modification, uh, promotion of the use of condoms, the mother-to-child transmission study was funded by NIH. The topical microbicide study was done at NIH sites together with USAID. The circumcision study was sponsored by the NIH. The pre-exposure prophylaxis study was sponsored by us. And the most recent very important treatment as prevention study is, is funded by us. So we have a very extensive portfolio in prevention. Very, very early on, because uh, we, there was a project called Projet Sida, which was in Kinshasa in the former Zaire, now the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And we sent down um, uh, an individual, uh, as did the CDC, as did the University of Antwerp. And that was sort of interesting, it was um, one of my people that I sent, that we sent down there was Tom Quinn, who is the associate director for our international AIDS and STD work. The person who was from the University of Antwerp was Peter Piat. Uh, and the people from the CDC 
was Jonathan Mann uh, when he was down at the CDC. And their experience in Kinshasa was totally different from what we were seeing here in the United States. And it was there that they realized that this was a 50-50 proposition, men and women. And it was overwhelmingly um, um, uh, heterosexually transmitted. And then as the years went by, when we were able to partner with a variety of Southern African countries, it became clear that this was an overwhelming problem in Southern Africa. But the first hint of it literally came from these studies that started in Projet Sida. PEPFAR is the emergency, president's emergency plan for AIDS relief, and it, it, it got started in an interesting way. Uh, uh, during the George W. Bush administration, uh, uh, President Bush sent uh, Tommy Thompson, who was the uh, uh, secretary of HHS at the time, and I, together with a group that the secretary was bringing down on a fact-finding uh, mission to various African countries to scope out what was going on down there. And when we came back, um, he asked me to put together a mother-to-child transmission, because it was just then that nevirapine was shown in a single dose to the mother, followed by a single dose to the baby right after birth. Mother during labor, baby right after birth, had a major impact on blocking transmission of mother-to-child. We came back and I made a proposal to the president with the help of his staff, who at the time was Josh Bolton and Gary Etson and, and Jay Lefkowitz and Margaret Spelling and then others, that a $500 million investment in mother-to-child transmission would be a very important contribution. After I presented it to him uh, in the Roosevelt Room, um, as I was walking out of the room, he grabbed me and grabbed uh, Josh Bolton and said, I want you to go back and, and, and make it something much bigger. I want a game changer for Africa. I want you to go and get multiple models and come back and work with the staff to see what we can do to really turn things around in Africa. And I want it to be feasible, I want it to be implementable, and I want it to be accountable. I don't want to just give money to foreign countries and say, go do it. So that was in April when I went the first time, and then from June of 2002, that was April 2002, from June 2002 until December 2002 and January 2003, I went back and forth with the White House of trying to get the right model. How many countries, how could you get the maximum number of people, can you include 50% of all the people in the de developing world infected, should you include India, should you include China, should you include the Caribbean, model it out, what would it cost, how much on treatment, how much on prevention. And it was really almost a full-time job back and forth. I employed a person who was uh, first a fellow in my lab but then became my assistant for a while who was interested in helping, his name is Mark Dibel, who actually turned out ultimately to become the uh, ambassador in charge of the uh, program after uh, Randy Tobias left. Make a long story short, we weren't sure that they were going to accept it because there were a lot of people, particularly the people who took care of the money, OMB and others, who were not enthusiastic about this plan that I put together that was $15 billion over five years. But I had the encouragement of the president, the encouragement of Josh Bolton and others, uh, particularly people who most people don't ever heard of, but were White House staffers who were very helpful, Gary Etson and, and Jay Lefkowitz and others. And we put the program together, and then I didn't know whether it was going to be accepted until the very beginning of January when they called me down to the White House and said, let's uh, figure out a couple of paragraphs to put into the... Uh, uh, State of the Union address on January 28th, 2003, and I just said, oh my God, it's going to happen, and it did, and uh, it's been extraordinary watching it evolve over the years. The impact is enormous. It's historic with regard to the, NI, with the, the, uh, the United States of America's uh, impact on a global health problem. It was the largest program devoted to a single disease in the history of our country. Right now, if you look at the numbers, uh, uh, there is over 3 million, between 3 and 4 million people who are on antiretroviral therapy. There's, you know, hundreds of thousands of babies have been saved from getting infected. Millions of people have been put under care. 
and it's still going strong. I mean, PEPFAR is, a, is the showcase uh, of uh, the United States' uh, AIDS effort throughout the world. Now it's part of President Obama's broader global health issue, so it's even taken bigger impact now because it's being linked to other global health problems. There is an urgency of a different type. Back then, it was an urgency of discovery, of make, getting drugs, of treating, of preventing. Now it's an urgency of implementation, where it's very frustrating because you have so many of the tools of treating people, of preventing infection, but the logistics and the resources available uh, it's a tough time right now, and there is a, a lot of feeling of urgency. We've got to do this because the impact could be enormous. We could actually get our arms around this pandemic and, and not only slow it down, but actually stop it. It would take a, a global commitment of resources that don't seem to be available right now. There are still 2.6 million new infections a year globally. 56,000 new infections per year in the United States. It is still a very bad, very unfortunate thing to get HIV infected. Just because that there are drugs available is no reason at all to think that, oh, it's okay to get HIV infected. It's not. It's a very serious disease. Even at best, you have to be on drugs that have some toxicities, Sometimes individuals have considerable toxicities to drugs. Right now, we hope to cure it, but right now, it means you have to take medications for the rest of your life. So just because we've been very successful, we've got to make sure that success is not associated with complacency, because then we'll never get out of the situation we're in right now. The only way to get out of this is to stop new HIV infections, and you're not going to do that if people are complacent.